Well, welcome back. Today's topic is the idea of rest. Let's face it, we don't get enough sleep. We worry about things that rarely do we have full control over. And we're always anxious about being able to fulfill and meet the expectations others have on us. We are in a life, we all live a life where we desire, we need, and we seek more rest. So what creates rest for you? I was thinking about this a little bit, and for me, there's just this moment of true restfulness that normally follows the completion of some major task. But I have to admit, it doesn't last long. I also have to admit that laying around and doing nothing doesn't create rest for me. In fact, it creates a state of restlessness. Maybe it's my type A behavior, or maybe it's uh, OCD, I'm not sure. But I don't think rest is necessarily a physical embodiment as much as it's a state of mind. Because activity tends to create rest for me, and lack of activity creates rest lessness for me. So we begin our study today by looking at the fourth chapter of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews was writing to an audience of Jewish Christians who were enduring some difficult times. Uh, they had chosen to follow Jesus in the way, and as a result of that, they were being persecuted and they were experiencing hardship. They were actually considering giving up and returning to their prior lives in the more mainstream traditional Judaism, somehow thinking that by doing that, things would be better. The writer of Hebrews is writing to encourage them not to give up. He's writing to, to, to implore them that, listen, the rest that you truly seek is ahead. It's not behind. Hang in there, don't give up, and continue to persevere. Well, we too may be able to take some ideas today in our quest for this ever-elusive state of rest that we seek, we too may be able to learn something and be inspired by the, the writer of Hebrews as we take a look at some of these verses from chapter 4. Listen to the words here of verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest is still open, let us take care that none of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So, what is this promise of rest that we're talking about here? Well, the writer is referring to the story of the ancient Israelites as they escape Egypt and go into the wilderness awaiting this promised land. This would be a time when this promised land would be a place of rest for them. It would be a place where they would have their own land. There would be nothing to worry about. There'd be no anxiety. They would be in God's abundance and God's blessing a place of true and permanent rest. But we also see in these verses that there is the warning to take care that we fail to reach it. So there's this warning that we may not, if we're not careful, we can miss out on accepting it. And we know, in fact, that the ancient Israelites, because they disobeyed God and because they quarreled with God, Really, only two, Caleb and Joshua, were the only two of that, of that group that actually were granted the ability to actually get into the promised land. So that's probably something that we need to reflect on in our own lives. You know, God, in the creation story back in Genesis, after he created everything, he took a day off of rest. Later, the idea of the Sabbath was God's way of saying, it's a good idea for my people to work hard, but then to take time to rest. But not only rest, but to take time to spend time with God, to show trust in Him. In today's world, we see so many times people are running 24-7 as hard as they can because they feel like it takes everything they have just to keep up, to somehow to, to measure up or to meet the expectations of our world. When we do that, we have to ask ourselves, what does it really say about who we trust? Are we trusting God or are we trusting in our own abilities? Now, the good news is there's an indication here that unlike with the ancient Israelites, the promise of entering God's rest for you and I is still open, just as it was for the early audience of the writer of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews is implying that while God's redemptive work is a gift to us, we still have to accept it. 
John Ortberg in this week's study guide had a great analogy to help us understand the role of human effort when it comes to the, to the life of faith. He talked about the two mistakes people make. One is they try to reach God's grace through their own efforts, and he likens that to rowing a boat across the ocean. Then he talks about the second mistake, which is doing nothing and just assuming that God's grace is all that's required. And, and Ortberg says that would be like throwing away your oars and hoping that you drift to God's grace. The better analogy or the better model would be that of a sailboat where nothing moves without the wind, which is God, but it still requires somebody to hoist the sail, which is our effort. So there's a pretty good example of how we, God's grace is a gift, but we must accept it. Well, in verses 11 through 16, the writer gives us three points of instruction about how to accept that gift of God's grace. In verse 11, we have, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall through such disobedience as theirs. You know, obedience leads us to rest. Doing the right thing makes us restful. Doing the wrong thing leads to anxiety and worry and restlessness. So here we see that obedience is the key or one of the keys to rest. You know, the good news for us is that we have the Holy Spirit living within us that guides us and directs us and helps us understand the way to be obedient to God. But we also see in the next couple of verses there a reference to God's Word and the idea of a two-edged sword. Uh, God's Word leads to rest for those who are obedient, and it leads to judgment to those who are disobedient. In verse 14 we have, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confessions. The writer is making a case to hold fast to their confessions, knowing full well that the people believe that it's these confessions which are causing them hardship. What would be the opposite of holding fast to their confessions? A retreat to the more mainstream and more traditional religious observances of Judaism? And what does it mean for you and I to hold fast to our confessions that Jesus is Lord of our life? Does that mean trusting, making the types of decisions that indicate that we trust and follow God, as opposed to trusting and following our own human and often flawed instincts? Holding fast to our confessions means resisting worldly temptations and holding fast the leadings of the spirit in our life. This is what leads to true and permanent rest. And finally, in verse 16 we have, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are called to approach the throne of God with boldness, to accept this gift of his grace and his mercy, knowing that we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus knowing that sin can no longer stand between us and God. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, we hear Jesus say, Come to me, those of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. So God's promise of rest is a gift to us, but it's a gift that we must accept. I don't know about you, but I've received over the years as, as a present many times a gift card in fact, I have a basket in my office that's full of unredeemed gift cards. You know, they're not really gifts. They're more of a promise of a gift. And until I take the effort and the energy to accept them by redeeming them for a purchase, they're really not a gift. Well, today's lesson reminds us that God's promise of rest for you and I is a gift. It's his mercy and it's his grace that provides that for us but it is one that we have to choose to accept. And we choose to accept that through being obedient to, to the Spirit and by choosing to, draw, to trust God and, to, and choosing to draw near to God to accept that rest. Well, my hope for you this week is that you will find that true rest that the writer of Hebrews talks about. I also hope you'll be back with us again next week when we continue our study from the book of Hebrews. Until then, 
Have a great week. God bless you. And we'll see you again next time.